everyone, and welcome to the Death by Adaptation podcast, a bi-weekly book club where we choose one classic book and compare and contrast it against its cinematic adaptations. I'm your host, Nicolo Grasso, and I'm joined, as always, by the great Yuan Gledo. How are you doing, Yuan? I'm alright. I'm, I'm knackered, so I feel a bit feral. But yeah, I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm holding up alright. Yeah, it's, you know, it rained yesterday massive massive thunderstorm i'd even say so there's a breezy 28 degrees in my room right now which is the lowest it's been in a while (laughs) which is crazy but today we're back from the venice film festival we're pre-recording this i don't know what we're going to be doing there special episodes maybe who knows if you're listening to this in the future you have the power of hindsight but we don't they know better than us but we're back on the regular schedule and we're back with one of our favorite guests. We have the lieutenant himself, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jakub Flash of the Anchor Gems podcast. Jakub, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Would you like to know more? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've eaten up your steak, you're, you've, you're on your military oh, yeah. diet, you know. Oh, yeah. Red I'm soldier on. How quick you ate that. I, oh yeah, seven this, this, minutes. Like let's just say I, it wasn't pretty, you know. <laughs> did you did you chew? Did you just eat it Some in one? It, yeah. It's like a seagull. Just kind of like <laughs> just, just, just gorging it. Just <laughs> like a pelican. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. But speaking of pelicans and disgusting things, today we're talking about a very, very special book and field combo. We're going back to Paul Verhoeven. But before we do. I see you there listening to us on Spotify, on Apple, on YouTube. Leave, leave us a like. Leave us, yes, Jakub, I see you. You're listening to us <laughs> right now. Leave that like. <laughs> Subscribe. You know, just do what, what the Federation would, would prefer for you. You cannot be a citizen if you don't uh, follow us on all <laughs> social media and leave us five stars. <laughs> but without further ado, let's talk about Starship Troopers. Young people from all over the globe are joining up to fight for the future. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. (laughs) They're doing their part. Are you? Join the mobile infantry and save the world. Service guarantees citizenship. Starship Troopers is originally a book. Written by Robert A. Heinlein. Heinlein? Heinlein? There's always, always these pronunciations when you're on Yakub. Uh, it's a sign. It's a sign. Heinlein. <laughs> Heinlein. Doesn't I matter. Heinle- I think it's Heinlein. Um, I would, uh, but if, if he was German, he would be Heinlein. Heinlein. But, That's how but, I would but say he's it. A German name, but he's American, so we never know if Americans of, of German of descent. Because, of you know. course. But the book, Starship Troopers, was released in 1959, a sci-fi classic, this tale of a federation, you know, we're 700 years in the future, and there's war, there's war with bugs on a massive planet, and uh, the world is united to kill them all, and in order to be a citizen of the world, you have to enlist in the military, you have to join up and fight. If you don't fight, if you're not part of the military system, you cannot vote. You are not a citizen. And so you follow Rico, Johnny Rico, right? Johnny Rico, Juan, yeah. Juanito. Juan Rico, well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Juan something Rico. I can't remember his middle name, though. But like he Filipino, a soldier of Filipino descent. He wants to enter the lived in military. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know these things. So weird. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting it Aires, choice. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's impo- like it starts off in Buenos Aires. You have you have basically this little kid, this teenager who's like, I'm graduating. I want to join the military, Dad. And that's like, no, I hate the military. This is wrong. This isn't good. Just don't do it. They're very upset. And he's like, screw it. I'm going. And there's also this hot chick that I really like. I'm going there. It's like Carmen. This book to me again. <laughs> hey, it's. it's <laughs> Just it's the same type of language that uh, Heinlein uses. This is hot chick. This is broad, Carmen, <laughs> and and yeah, just this, basically the book ends up being primarily about the training regime that Johnny goes through 
and all of the different moral and political and philosophical complications and implications of war and militarism. And there's also a lot of action, a lot of fighting bugs. So, Jakub, what are your thoughts on the novel Starship Troopers? On the novel? Well, I was very pleasantly surprised because it's nothing like the film. <laughs> so this was, was a first time read, right? This was a first time read and I was very interested to, to read it. And I, I'll have to come clean. I read it with the sort of um, uh, perspective of knowing its reputation. <clears throat> Same. Same. So, so just to put, put let's let the cat out of the bag. The book, the book has a reputation. I mean, it had it had been reviewed in the past. I think in the fifties and sixties as uh, potentially pro pro fascist, and then people were oh, yeah. accusing Heinlein of being a fascist. So I read this through, like that with this lens. sort of lens in mind. Okay, well, do, like, just to see. Okay, well, whether whether there is something to be fished out of there or not. So I was reading this, and then I was swept away, and I just think like, these people are idiots. <laughs> I just don't know what they're talking about. This book's great, actually. It's oh, very my. interesting, and it's not, and it's nothing like I would have expected it. What it would it would have been. I was put it this way. It just took me by surprise because it's kind of. I want to say, it's it's like all quiet on on Western Front, but without the moral cautionary tale. Mm. If you know what I mean. Mm. So, so without without with a so with with a bit of a different journey. So you know, whereas like in. And like Eric Maria remark when when he was writing this, he was writing this as a, as a jaded veteran who lost all his friends, uh, and he was realizing that war is war is probably the worst thing that that happened to humankind. I think Heinlein was writing this in a bit of in, in a bit of a sort of bout of triumphalist uh, attitude, where uh, where we're still kind of just going through through post World War Two, post war in Korea, um, sort of. Um, attitude of yay americans ha uh, have saved the world and then you know let's let's appreciate this for a, for a second i think that was kind of his attitude and it really shows and mm -hmm. it just and i never expected because we say oh there's a lot of action in the book i'm not even sure there is there's one of one of the like three mini stories where there's action and, and it's mostly about the training it's mostly about what happens in mobile in mobile infantry and it's mostly about uh, the career of Johnny Rico, who just starts as a, mis a misguided boy, and ends up a career, uh, a commissioned officer. He finds and his place up, and finds his place, and be, and ends up like the the whole sort of circle of uh, just the whole the, the whole thing kind of just turns circular because he be, be, he actually becomes a legend of the sort of of the outfit as well. He he earns his stripes in there. So they I named kind the of outfit been... after him as well. Just like yeah, yeah. So, the so, highest praise. So you can only imagine that he will then retire from the army and he will start teaching like whatever moral philosophy that the Rastrak was. Oh no, the Dubois, Colonel Dubois, Dubois was. Kind yeah. of just, was Rastrak is in the film. It's just it's, well, anyway. Um, so I enjoyed the book because of how uh, because it's called science fiction, and I'm just thinking like, it's not really a science fiction novel. It's almost like a like a thin red line. But written, but written, written in a science fiction setting. It's just, mm -hmm. it's almost just not about just any science science fiction sort of conceits. It's it, it's using its conceit to actually tell other things. But I'll leave it at that. So I kind of I quite enjoyed this, and I'm actually thinking I should probably check out more of Heinlein's work. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 a good point, especially because it's it does feel like the sci-fi comes second, doesn't it? Like mm -hmm. he wasn't really interested in that aspect, despite being a popular sci-fi novelist himself. But we'll get to, we'll get to some of the deeper things happening in this book. Johan, your turn. Sh oh, share your turn. sweet, sweet thoughts. Um, yeah, just to riff on what you said there, it feels like sci-fi comes secondary. Yeah, and I think that's probably for the best. I feel like it gives Heinlein enough space to criticize or appreciate American military culture of the nineteen fifties without it being so obvious that it's like, oh, we do love our our, our United States military <laughs> corporations. Um, I loved it. I really, really enjoyed reading this. Um, and I think it, it's it's the perfect blend of either he's being very satirical or he's blinded by patriotism, but either way, it's very nice that we can rip him for either of them. Um, I got my schedule slightly incorrect and read this in January, so I've read it. <laughs> um, Did you so go through, uh, through a Wikipedia synopsis instead? <laughs> yes, uh, Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. Thank you. Um, no, I think it's it's a really nice 
piece, and as much as Johnny Rico is hilarious as a main character's name, it feels as if the book centers itself on the collective, the sort of camaraderie that comes from allegedly serving in the military. I've not served in any sort of organization or group, so I don't, I don't really know. The closest I've come to is Clapper and Uncut Gems. That's that's about as, as, as close to service to anything I get. Um, do, you, do you want me to commission you as a as, as an officer? Send you yeah, to please. Med school. I'm already yeah. a registered minister, so I may as well. <laughs> that's I, my favorite I, I, story. <laughs> have I told that story on this podcast before? I feel it's like a priesthood and military. Hey, I'm the a, same. Like, I'm also, a, you get to wear a uniform. I'm an ordained reverend of the Universal Life Church. Um, so, a soldier of the be, church. If you ever want to be married or anything, I'm, I can do that in certain countries. Um, married but, to cinema. We need to go to America to do. You don't have to go to America to do me. I'm, <laughs> I'm only licensed in Madagascar and like I don't know parts of Eastern Europe. Perfect. But oh. um, no, I, I think. Hi, to, just to link it back to Heinlein <laughs> somehow um, no I think it's a really good book um, I really enjoyed it for the sort of pulpy nature to it the The sci-fi does come second because first place is essentially the violence, the action, the brutality of war and the, the many sort of facets of criticism he wants to level into it um, but I come from a perspective of I do think he's being a bit satirical and a bit you know I could be wrong because I have no idea. I don't know much about Heinlein. But... There's no right and wrong here. I mean, there is. You, absolutely, there probably is. It's just we can't ask him because he's dead. Yeah, and I don't. Do I don't suppose for? you would be like David Lynch. Like I don't know. It's for you to figure out. <laughs> the book speaks for itself, Yakub and Yuan. <laughs> you know but the yeah. answer in your heart. I, I bloody don't. That's why I'm here. <laughs> figure it out. It's like I don't want to talk about this. I want to be taught about it. You know. Just teach me, show me the way. Um, my thoughts on this book, I was fairly ambivalent to it, all things considered. Um, I think what, 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 there are two things that really appeal to me in here. It's the moral conundrums and conversations that they have <clears throat> about war, about the way this world works, about just the importance of the military which is something that I've always, you know, kind of thought about, especially considering that I come from a family of soldiers and people in the military, like going back generations and generations, still my father. And I'm breaking. So how come you're, you're not a, a, you know, a soldier? S- sucks. S- sucks. You know, you're always moving around. You cannot enjoy mm. much time with your family because you're always working horrible hours. You're always in missions far away if it's not I do that Kosovo now. or Afghanistan. <laughs> well, they don't call it a career. They call it a service. It's yeah. a service, yeah. yeah. And I, I moved around enough times to the point that I would never want that on my offsprings and my future partner and whatnot. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and so Army it's, is your wife. Come on. The army the is army. your wife, basically, yes. You're married to the... To the You're army. To the job. You're married to the country, okay? You're married to the country. Forgotten country. And so there are some, so many parts in this book that I found very compelling and very interesting. And I love moral philosophy. That's something that I've always been fascinated by. But um, I think for me, it's probably very banal as a, as a response, but just I find it I'm not dull because it's not dull, but just it's a bit slow for my taste. Um there are some sections, especially in the training, which is very grounded. I think it's it's. I think most of us, or all of us, actually saw the movie beforehand, like like a few years ago, a few weeks ago, whatever. Like before reading the actual novel, and so you have that iconography in mind. So reading the novel, but it's like they're they're doing the the training in Toronto, or like in Canada, something like that. And like there's different types of terrain, and they spend like weeks in the wild trying to survive. It's very much a survival of the fittest type of scenario. They were their train, and it was a bit hard to kind of readjust the way I was envisioning it from Verhoeven's iconography. But, yes, I think overall, I didn't really love this book, barely liked it in a, in terms of entertainment, but there is a lot of interesting things about it. And I think the, the, the main one, you, you mentioned it, Jakub, you did as well, you and just, what is this book? Is it satire? Or is it actually endorsing militarism, jingoism, and all other beautiful isms from the U.S. Army. 
think, it's a heavy oh, question. It is, yeah, and I think uh, I'm just going to read it because I've got the SF Masterworks copy, and Graham Slate did a really good introduction where he says Heinlein has a number of arguments he wants to test out about the military, and the one that stuck out for me was its ideal composition and structure, um, and why it should be valued. Now, to to me, a statement like that sort of leans towards Heinlein is trying to understand the responsibilities of the military and its sort of importance in in the world, or, or at least what he perceived as important. And I think that's what levels it as sort of a, yeah, he's actually trying to understand it a bit better. But on the flip side of that, I, I still think there is a, a biting satire to it. And I think maybe it's because, like you said, we all watched the film before we read the book, and it's hard to disassociate that feeling from the book, especially when a lot of stuff Highland is writing, whether he's genuine or not, does come off as a bit satirical and does come off as a bit sort of morally dubious. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of it comes down to him trying to understand the, the relationship between the military and civilians as well as military and warfare. Um, whether or not he does that well, I'm still not sure. And I think that's why I like Starship Troopers quite a lot. Um, it's the implication of there's a real adventure and a real journey. He knows where he's going. He's going to A to B, and it's quite clear. And it's the details that are sort of sprinkled in, the the little reflections on a previous mission or, like, just a, a little character interaction here or there. And that's the real meat of what he's trying to say. But he buries them so well, and I'm, I'm impressed because you could read Starship Troopers and think, ah, oh, yeah, it's just about killing bugs and stuff. Um... But there is a lot to it, and I think most of that is sort of there. It's just out in the open, but at the same time, it's very difficult to understand it, as you can probably tell, because I'm just rambling. <laughs> <laughs> so That's what do right. you think he's satirizing, then? And just and just kind of just asking, because I'd like to kind of see what I what yeah. I will have to respond to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel it's like to some ready. degree, he's satirizing the, the, the relationship between soldiers between like the camaraderie of it 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 never feels genuine in a starship troopers it always feels like a little elevated or a little on the nose but maybe that's an intentional choice as a writer for him to go aren't, aren't these brave boys off fighting about i, I don't know it, it could just be something that you know that, that might just be his writing style where he's really leaning into it because he fully believes in it but I, i'm not convinced wholly that the patriotism at the heart of Starship Troopers is entirely heartfelt. Oh, I mean, I don't see the way the question was phrased. You could, I could either answer like it's neither or there, it's both. Because he, what I think he, I think he does satirize certain certain things in the book. Although I don't think he. What what you what you read as um, as satire? So the elements of like the sort of the elevated nature of the sort of the camaraderie, and then I think he's just being earnest because like you kind of have to remember that he was a former navy serviceman. Like he's a guy who was a, an officer in the navy, and he was an officer in the navy who retired just I think a few years before the outbreak of World War Two. So he didn't get to fight, and so he he was he was one of those sort of frustrated generations, I think, where he was too young to too young to fight in World War One and too old to fight in World War Two, and he was just the right kind of people who 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 wanted who would want to go and fight, if you know what I mean. So I think there's there's certain kind kind of frustrations protruding through the book, I, and that what I think he's satirizing is. There's there's an element of satire, although I think the book as a whole is not satirical. There's an element of satire where where I think he's um, poking uh, jabs at the structure of American military as it was at the time. So as I think he was critical of what military was, of certain elements of it, and he was and he would want the military to be in the future something some, something different to elevate itself or evolve itself to be to become something better. And I think what you read as satire is the sort of, the sort of idyllic, sort of sort of rose tinted viewpoint of what he thinks the military should capitalize on. So that sort of like that everything's simple. That you know there's a chain of command. Then everything everything goes from A to B to C to D to E. There is there there are men in the in, in here who would die from for 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 the for their brothers in arms. They would. There, there is there are these things. These things are a little bit sort of I don't want to say blown out of proportion, but a little bit sort of yeah, kind of shown through 
uh, rose tinted glasses, I would say. What I don't think that there is satirical is just just the whole concept of the book. I don't I don't think he is, and also I don't think he's jingoistic. I think he's genuinely concerned that the um, following and there are certain passages in the book that kind of point to this when he's when when specifically when they're talking about militaries of the past that mm-hmm. they did this, this that way or that or or the other or or you know when we had. These officers for for nurseries. There, there was an, there's an officer for um, for toilets, and there was like there, there were these all these civil. There were just a step above civ- civilians, and there's everyone's an officer, but no one has the sort of the duty or the sacrifice or the conviction to um, to to perform and uh, to take this job seriously. Because for him, the sort of idea of going to the army is not a job. This is not a career. This is a um, this is a calling. So I think this comes through. This may come through as jingoistic because I think he's genuinely passionate about this. And then for me, the the, the way to read this book is to actually see this as an allegory for the U.S. Marines. Like he's he's talking oh, wow. about what U.S. Marines should be, and what what what's the sort of like what he thinks the best elements of it are. And and there so and there should be kind of just a, 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 I think there, there it's a, there's a bit of an um, apotheosis in there, sort of like baked into this. That's that's a great comparison, actually, because the book itself has been part of a reading list for Marines mm-hmm. <laughs> since like the sixties, I want to say, soon after it was released, basically. And it kind of ties into I like I went into this as well, kind of expecting either the overly fascist, super earnest, like horribly militaristic novel, and the more you know, like you just don't get it. This is deeply satirical take that some critics had. And I honestly don't really see the satire as much as both of you in the respective ways that you see it. I didn't see much of that here. There are definitely some parts that are a bit heightened um, and a bit over the top and exaggerating, a bit too convenient, I'd even say. There's a couple interactions here that were a bit the, odd. The big paragraphs on liberty, for instance. I, mean, I don't think it's... Uh, maybe uh, maybe satire is a too strong a word for this. I think it's criticism. Well, like, well, yeah, criticism, yeah. poking fun, but it felt it did feel very earnest to me in general um, about how all of this works and how... Like it, it, I, I, there were certain portions of this where it did feel like I was almost being asked to recruit right after reading a chapter. It's like, doesn't this seem like, like, look at them, these little pussies, they're becoming men. (laughs) It's like, see, they're becoming strong, they're becoming more serious, they are finding out what they want to do in life. Because that's one of the interesting things. It's like, this is not only a sci fi military war novel but it's also a coming of age story because johnny rico uh juan rico sorry kind of well, it's johnny it's just his mom calls him juan right well because yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's so just, you never know i like guess that's that's the point right because it's a terran federation the, the world is a country yes exactly like nationality doesn't really matter everything's tied together and and you see him grow up from being someone who's hard like absolutely terrible at school with like attention deficit disorders and doesn't get good grades. He's always like having verbal sparring with his professors. And he becomes like, you know, he starts following the rules more. He starts caring more about other people. And he embraces the fact that he's part of a system. And he is needed to move the system forward. But if he were to die, protecting his country and trying to defeat the enemy... That would be an honorable death and there would be someone else taking his place. And that's comforting. And I was reading those passages and I was just like, my skin was crying. I was like, no. <laughs> but it's not about this, by the way. I want to say like, oh, I, I never got this sort of like, oh, it's about killing the enemy or protecting their country. No, it's about service. The well, sort of yeah, idea, but that's well, part of the service. almost like, oh, well, it's just p- part of what we do because we're being asked to do it. We're a service. But we're a tool in the hands of, of the government. Yeah. For I mean, that, the it's all leading aspect. up to that. So it's not like he's going like, I'm going to go because I really want to go and kill some bugs, right? And then no, 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 no. It's, it's, so it, it's almost like when you say it's he's part of a system, I want to say he's he finds identity within a group because he's kind of groupless as a, as a teenager. He doesn't have his his people and he finds so, his people. But also the individual also... loses identity. In the group. Well, he doesn't lose the his identity because he has this identity as uh, well. He he remains re- retains his identity. He progresses. He he becomes an officer. Like he's, he, it's not like he's just well one of one of many. He actually stands out of the crowd. Well, it's, that's True. exactly the point, though. It's like with chapter fourteen. Those those little quote indents he does before the chapter 
Mm. Um, like, I, I don't know, I saw the Churchill one at Chapter 11, I thought anyone that quotes Churchill, I mean, if Highland were alive now, he had a Peaky Blinders Facebook profile picture, but the, <laughs> in Chapter 14, it's um, there's two quotes from the Bible from Matthew in Chapter 12 and 15, 18, sorry, I was reading Roman numerals, and my maths isn't good, and two of them are both about how much then is a man better than a sheep, and it's kind of like yeah, Johnny Reek was a very unique character, but I feel like that is a more grounded criticism of that difference between service and career. That sort of blend of these people are all one and the same. They are all wearing the same uniform. They're all sheep, essentially, being sent off to, to fight. But I think I'm giving too much credit from listening to Use to, too much credit to Heinlein's sort of scope for criticism. Um... You know, when I saw Thomas Jefferson and Winston Churchill quotes crop up in a book about military fiction, I thought <laughs> very funny, nice bit of satire. But he might have been genuine. Which this is, is genuine. It felt yeah, genuine. It's yeah, actually genuine. Yeah. Think about who wrote it. This is a guy who writes it. Who who was at the well? He was in the military, sort of at the sort of, let's just say first half of the twentieth century. He's a guy who, by our standards, would be extremely conservative. I w- I don't want to use terms like ultra right wing because it kind of brings in there a whole host of connotations that I don't he necessarily has. O- although I wouldn't be surprised if he was uh, if if he had like prejudices against like Japanese people, for instance, mm-hmm. and would be grounded in experience because he would have probably lost his friends somewhere in there, right? But anyway, so I think he's genuine, genuine in that he idolizes people like Churchill, who in in his eyes, like think about this, this is a guy who watched from the sidelines how World War Two unfolded and how it was and how it was brought to a uh, to a conclusion. And Winston Churchill was was one of those guys who made it happen, right? That you know that the the, the Allies won the war. So you could see that he's he's looking up to people like Jefferson. He's looking up to people like Churchill, and he's actually. And, and he's probably very intimately aware of the Bible as well. So he's looking up to people like Roger Kipling, for instance. And then nowadays you say that you say this name out loud. It's not. Um, then it brings in the connotation of colonialism, imperialism, and racism, right? Because mm. you can, oh, yeah. because the, the audiences change. And I think for us to appreciate the book, I think for what it, I mean, you can appreciate for what it is now. And then fair enough, you can say that it doesn't probably fit. In our our days, sort of the the worldview of today, through our optics, is a, it's it's a bit sort of obsolete. But through the optics of the fifties, when he was writing this, it was a criticism of of what he thought was abandonment of conservative values. I think he was he was genuinely lamenting that the that the mil- the military needs to stay strong in order to protect the peace on the planet, and then the military needs to retain certain mod- certain sort of level of. Um, exaltation to actually be stronger and be strong enough to handle any threat possible because we've come to they've we've come to realize in the for, in, in the 40s that they can come from anywhere and you, don't, you won't even know when this happens because overnight you'll be at war like yeah. pearl harbor happens out of nowhere and then you know and all of a sudden you wake up and you see a see a newspaper headline we're at war thanks very much right so I think he's genuine. There's, there's, there isn't satire in here. I think he's genuine. And then the ele- elements that could be misconstrued as satire, as satire are the sort of allegorical sort of switches where he uses bugs or he uses the words like skinnies or whatever, mm-hmm. um, which I don't think they're necessarily sort of meant to be um, derogatory sort of stand-ins for someone. I mean, there's to me, the one obvious stand-in is the bu- bugs are essentially Japanese, the Imper- Imperial Japanese Army, and the entire sort of military co- campaign that they're out, that they're on is basically retaking pacific islands <laughs> and he's talking about world war ii that he could not participate in without talking about it because he he couldn't write i, I think he didn't have it in him i think this is me speculating he could, didn't have it in him to sit down and write a story about a war he didn't see it wouldn't be fair it wouldn't yeah. be fair, and I think he. This is a. He, I think he's. He was a highly principled man. He wouldn't go and say like, "I'm not going to invent this shit." Like, I'm going to leave this to guys like James Jones, who actually went there, and then he was. He was on, on, on Guadalcanal retaking Solomon Islands, and he saw his friends die. Right, like that's not. Mm. If you if you ever do the Thin Red Line, that's that's a book to do. Actually, I'd I'd love to do that. Actually, yeah. it's it's a massive book, and it's a horrifying book, but it's, it's written by a guy who actually saw it happen. Right. 
He was on the sh on these ships. He saw his friends sink. He saw it, he saw his friends blown to bits by, and he, and he he knows what it what it, what 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 the sort of the day to day reality of cleaning out foxholes like these sort of like when they go on the planet planet P right, and they look for holes with bugs. These this is to me this is exactly if you know anything about World War Two this was exactly what what sort of the Pacific world looked like. They were trenches. Uh, Descending, not even trenches, descending on a small island where nothing, re like in like in like the thin red line, for instance, there's nothing in there. There's because everyone's on the ground, and they come out of these little holes in the ground. They shoot at you, and then just they and stab then just, you, and just stab you, stab and then you. just and then just hide hide back in, and then they look like they have a hive mind because they they their principles are different. They don't they won't sur like not not a single Japanese unit ever surrendered to anyone. They will blow themselves up with, with grenades. They'll 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 charge at you uh, to their deaths, and but they will never surrender. So this this sort of idea of they're, they they're like a swarm of of people you can't reason with. This is these are the bugs because there's probably a brain somewhere, and this brain is like their their officer. And then there is a queen, which is the emperor, who's all just in sort of in the distant sort of places, just puppeteering these people who have no no will of their own because they look like they have no will of their own because they are so. Uh, devoted to the cause that they're fighting for, right? So I think this is it. This 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 is how I when I understood this, and the historical no uh, note at the end actually proves this because the the book is dedicated to a guy called Roger Young, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And there's the, there's a ship named name after him um, in the book, and he's a guy who was actually on the Solomon Islands, uh, and it says in that he he died in 1943 and he, he received a Medal of Honor. So clearly, to me, he's this is a love letter to the military that would be capable of defeating this threat again, and he thinks this is what this is this is how we need to evolve as a, as a, uh, as an institution to actually handle this properly, and this is how we need to appreciate the people who actually go out and do it. So I think he's genuine, and then when I saw this sort of allegory to World War II, this 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 book became fascinating to me because it's just like, this is not science fiction. The science fiction is just a coating because he really needs to, he wants to talk about other things and he's using the science fiction as a stand-in because he, he feels in his heart of hearts that he, he's not allowed to talk about a war he hasn't seen. That's my take. Sorry. No, I yeah. think you've, you've pretty much convinced me it's not satire, actually, because <laughs> I think fr from my perspective, it was kind of like, I think I was projecting a sort of tongue-in-cheek, oh yeah, nobody really thinks that. And as it turns out, he he does think that. <laughs> I think the big one for me was the one where it's like you've got to have military service for full citizenship. That stuck with me. It's like surely nobody can actually believe that. But then you read the Graham Slate introduction. It's like Heinlein was pretty big on that. Like he mm -hmm. was, and pretty... it's historically precedented as well. He looks like yeah. the Romans tried it. The Greeks have tried it. Like in Gre in 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 ancient Athens, you like you can just go and vote if you like to be a citizen. You'd have to be of certain kind. You'd have to earn this, right? So Which I is think fascinating he, because he's going way back in time. <laughs> yes, but man. then he, but he he picks and chooses these things, and then they, they talk about it in the book as well, and say like, yep. "Oh, you know, the Greeks had a good idea, but they ruined this this way, and then we're Im improving on this idea by taking this, but not taking that." And then he's honest, like you think that he's actually thinking about these things as an author. He actually this this is his life's philosophy that he's laying out to you. Do you think it's a borderline utopia in that sense? Because it did, like, it, yep. especially yes. knowing that he kind of constructed this as a response to the suspension of nuclear testing in mm -hmm. the 50s, where it was like, no, <laughs> we need the power, we need the army, we need to protect ourselves, this is dangerous. Again, history repeating itself. If this happened mm -hmm. before, we've heard, like, the, the attack in Buenos Aires, which is decimated by the bugs that destroyed from their spaceship. Pearl Harbor, whatever. by That's the way. Pearl Harbor, yeah, 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 basically, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, because and they also... weren't at war. They were just like, oh, we're, we're kind of just like, there's this sort of thing going on, but we're not part of this. And all of a sudden we're, we're dragged into war. We shouldn't do this, say the parents. Dead. Or at least, yeah, the mother's dead because the surprise, mother's... surprise, and, and the dad comes back, baby. And he's and the joined the come... army. Yeah. <laughs> at yeah. the end, father and son are together. And but that's, that's also, also a comment, right? Like, see, you're, you pacifists. You think that this this is we're all crazy here, but shit will happen to you, and then you will change your minds because this happens. Like people will change their minds, well, they will get radicalized in some way, and they'll say like, "Okay, now I have to do this, right?" And that was just disturbing to me. <laughs> I mean, but then he oh, yeah. does say himself, it's it's like it's not like well, 
that his mother's death was pushed uh, was what pushed him to be like i need to go and kill bugs it was just like no he he understood that he he lived the life of not of because he was he was cowardly that's that's another thing that he, it's a very sort of old school conservative way of looking at there, you have to be courageous as a man mm -hmm. and his father was not he was afraid that he wouldn't do it he would or he was afraid of for his own life so he took the safe way out and he was always regressing this and his his wife's death pushed him to say like, okay, well now i have to do this because as a result of my the, my cowardice as a as a youngster now my wife is dead because if if i had been more courageous maybe we wouldn't be in Buenos Aires when the bugs hit it or something like this, right? So I think it's just like you have to read, read it through the sort of lens of someone or read it, through with a, read it with an appreciation that someone who read it could be like your grandpa who's just very, very old-fashioned. <laughs> well, Not necessarily like, you know, um, racist or anything, but just very old-fashioned, very sort of um, like very... Like chivalrous and very, you know, like he's, he's like very principled. Yeah, the, the way you were describing Heinlein earlier, I thought like, yeah, this feels like someone from the John Wayne generation of people. Then I looked, and they were yes. born a couple months apart, both in 1907, like a couple months apart, literally the same year. <laughs> I was like, well, there you go, precise, like the exact, like stereotype that you were talking about. Yeah, and it's he's, uh... it's, it's, it's an understandable frustration as well, and they, and they use it for art for entertainment and it worked um i think the reception to this was well well i, I said of the controversy because I, like we, we've mentioned the controversies in terms of criticism but like the people the people not only loved it the people still love it i found it very interesting going through the various versions that you can find on the youtube of the audiobook of this and just reading comments from people, and they are mostly, if not only, uh, extremely positive. Coming as well from a lot of veterans. People saying, like, I fought in Vietnam, I fought in the Gulf War, and, you know, like, the training and everything, and the feeling of camaraderie, and, mm -hmm. like, doing something for your country and defending it, and this is what's right. It's exactly like how he experienced it, and how he gets it, and he loves uh, patriots. Again, very. I want to say all of them were American. Very at the time, okay. <laughs> yes, like very much at the time. Very much <laughs> entirely American because I doubt there were any like I don't know like German officials writing these things in uh, on YouTube. No, but it's aimed at Americans. It right? is. Like it is a very American book, definitely. Yeah, it's because it's it is based on the U.S. Marines. So like, if if you I don't know served in West Point, you'd probably know like, oh, this is kind of like it, like his, what his officer training feels like mine. Like where they were just like giving me just headaches with the math books and whatever like this like because they're just very particular with the maths or whatever so <laughs> it feels like he in puts these details in that people in the know will say like this is exactly how it happened to me like or his, my sergeant was like you know he was exactly like zim or he was exactly like this guy i got flogged as well <laughs> Yeah, or you know, like he or the captain will be just like he thinks that he doesn't care, but he know you knows you by first name, and if you go and a ask him a question, he will give you not only give you an answer, he will give you a signed form already that he that he has in his drawer because he knew you'd come and and ask for it, right? Yeah. So, you know, he's. I think he's. Yeah. So I I'm not really surprised <laughs> that, no. the, that people kind of have this sort of appreciation towards it, and the people who kind of don't have it, then they tend to be. I think. I think there's a political motivation if you go and say like this book's fascist or because because like, they call them bugs and the Nazis call Jews rats on vermin and they just draw the line and all of a sudden it's it's all it's all the same for, to them like it's to yeah me, like, I I, is, I yeah I, I don't agree with this extremist view that some people have of the book even though like I I agree with the uh, the Japanese comparison one hundred percent but I also see a little bit of. Um, of uh, communist, anti-communist statements in this because of the whole hive mind the way it works. We're still talking about like the end of 1950s. This is when we're also getting, you know, all of the all of the creature features and monster movies in the US. We're all about so the fear, the giant bugs, them invading yeah. the country. Because well, there's, like. there's Cold War. Korean War is just about like um, it's finished like a few years before. Either. Yeah, brought us, brought us almost to a, a brink of um, nuclear annihilation. That was that was a fun time. Vietnam yeah. War has been raging already, and Americans just about getting involved. It's the end of France, right? yeah. Hmm. So it's it's a terrible time, and I think it's I think it's a criticism aimed at like th see this is why we're in this mess. 
<laughs> like or in his eyes, right? Like, in this his is eyes, why. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, because obviously we're in this mess for other reasons as well, but I think it also just the idea of, like, there's this is an old-fashioned conservative view that having a strong military helps you retain peace because you know no one's going to attack you if, if 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 you're the scariest dog in the in, in the neighborhood right so that's the sort of old fashioned view of this and then there's some value to it and there's also some value to okay well training men and then making honing them into sort of well functioning sort of human beings who actually even though who don't have skills you think because he has ADHD and something else and he doesn't know what he wants he finds his calling and he finds shit that he's good at right so but so there is there is there is a benefit to doing this to training people to to fight or to do things like this because of this like old saying like better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war or something like this <laughs> because you know I'm saying never heard yeah. that before do you think um I forgot what I was going to say brilliant <laughs> <laughs> sorry um <laughs> the ramble meister has come in to show sorry do you want no, 10 no, seconds it was, it was... to <laughs> It was what you'd said about um, yeah. So the the his his view of you know Vietnam War was going on, Korean War just ended. There was essentially national and international disarray, and to me it feels like Starship Troopers is one of those sort of usual socio political commentaries of here's the solution probably wouldn't work, but let's run with it anyway. There's no real solution in Starship Troopers. There's just a lot of they did it in Athens that might work. Here's Churchill, and it's. I think that's why I took it as satire, because I, I didn't think... I think it's probably because contemporary, you know, Verhoeven, who we'll get on to, I, I didn't think that anybody could actually hold within it 300 or so pages of actually... You know, because there are some good criticisms in here of the military, of the sort of relationship between the value of an individual and sort of the collective of a squadron. And he touches on that in the last chapters, where it's like the addendums essentially. Oh, he got the Medal of Honor when he died. And that was pretty much mm-hmm. it. But he, um, but but he mentions people by name as well. So it's not like the, does, the, yeah. the, the, there is the sort of like, well, this is the sort of again another threat to fascism because like fascism is a collective, a collectivist ideology, right? Kind of like mm-hmm. communism, but with extra steps because you have to hate some some exe- uh, some specific group of people based on their characteristics, not exactly on the class level. But anyway, so. He meant like when he says, "Oh, here's your squadron," and but they always mention people by name. There's no like you have an idea that like the teams he's in. So if he has his squadron, so, so his team, his platoon, his fire team, and whatever the regiment, battalion, and whatever, there's always names, and he and yeah, he yeah, knows but... his friends' names. It's like who like okay, if I if I make you a sergeant, who are you going to make your acting something squad leaders? And he's just like this guy or that guy, you know? Like he he like he he knows names. It's not like. So you, yeah, no, you but, have sort of, but then you've got yeah. the the issue of what presence does that have for the reader, and also they're just names. Are they not? They're just sort of a benefit for the reader. Uh, the benefit so is the, such that I think you 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 might you. I think the book makes you think like you're con, you're invested in a world that's sur- that's sort of filled with people, so you're not in a sea of just faces. nameless faces. It's people. Well, it's like the, He's just the assassin. Does he ever have a name? Just like as an example. Yes, he like has, he's, assassin he is his nickname, and his and his nickname is basically just based on his last name. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I like think, Jelly yeah. is Jalal or something like this, right? That, I, th- I think those can coexist, though. Where it's like, so Johnny Rico essentially has his friends and the people he knows, but mm-hmm. then the wider step back from that is he's one in a huge collective. Everybody's going to have people's names that they know. So Heinle could have dropped us anywhere. Uh, names, put, I mean, anywhere with a sort of this, this sort of p- the pyramid structure. I think that because the military has this sort of structure of like, well, here's me. I'm a private. I am all I'm responsible for is my rifle and my buddies, right? But then there's your corporal, and he's responsible for us. And then there's sergeant, and there's captain, and someone, and someone, and someone, and someone, and until until you go to the the, the the big star general, right, or whoever. Yeah. But then, as you pull back, you still don't. I think he makes a good. Um, effort actually not losing definition because it, as you pull back you still see names it's just as you pull back now you're interested in officers and they they care about their teams and then but they're friends with one another or they have their own sort of dynamics and then as you pull back the officers who run these guys they also have their own dynamics and it just feels like it's just a bustling sort of society within a society like it's its own little country within a country yeah okay i suppose that redefines the 
quarter users, which was um, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, does he leave the ninety nine? I suppose that redefines that actually. Yeah, yeah, that's Where that's about the yeah, duty of the yeah. officer, right? It's pyramid mm-hmm. selling rather than mm-hmm. pushing. So I think this is game. not satirical. Like, well, I mean, if you oh like, if yeah, you really I'm, try, I'm then you can say satirical. like it's satirical, or he's he's mocking something. You, I don't. You think can use is. it with anything at the end of the day if you want. Yeah. <laughs> anything is potentially satirical. I think the reason I thought it was satirical is because of the movie, because Verhoeven really drives into that, and I think Verhoeven sort anyway, of... Speaking but of, before, we speaking speak of, of before we speak of the movie, actually, the last two, last two things, actually, I wanted to talk about briefly mm. about the book. Um, which, which, like, the first one, I think, are a very simple thing, but, like, he has very interesting gender politics, um, Heinlein, where he very kind of... Very old-fashioned, yes. Well, old-fashioned, but also he... Yeah, he use he sees men like he uses men and women in equal ways. You have the women who like are uh, fighter pilots and like uh, doing the time space travel, or whatever. It's fascinating. It's an interesting thing, you know. He doesn't dwell on it too much, which is also welcome, I think. But it ties into the whole, you know, old school military war novel. But <laughs> the biggest difference, especially, is with the film that we're going to get to in a second, is the use of power armors, which is probably the most sci-fi thing of this book, right after the the, the setting itself and the bugs and being set in the future. You know, this use of power armors where they make the soldiers uh, like heightened and more powerful. It's the, I want to say the first instance of a novel, sci-fi novel, that uses this concept of these powerful armors that just augment their movements and they give them protection against the enemies. And we will see them later in countless novels and video games like the Fallout series. Starcraft. Guys... These are more than Starcraft. Starcraft, yeah. Well. The massive, the, the, the Marines. Mm-hmm. Do you like guys these, these, these power armors? Yeah, no. Because I know I know people, I, I wouldn't have talked <laughs> about like it, but I was looking online. Chapters people talking about the armor. <laughs> <laughs> they, they lose their mind on this. Like, the people that read this, not so much for the military propaganda, you could say, but they read it for the sci-fi element, mm-hmm. they yeah. go bananas on these armors. I suppose it's because, I mean, obviously we discussed earlier, sci-fi is not really the main point. It's Starship Troopers, but it is prevalent because it is science fiction. It just so happens that it's been subverted by its own message and its characters are to being able to be dropped in as metaphors and references. The actual science fiction stuff of Starship Troopers is really, really good. And I think that's that's why I really liked it, is the fact that underneath all the military jargon and the Heinlein's points is that he does have a little soft spot for science fiction, especially the power armor, which I, I, I'm in no position to comment whether or not that was the first instance of it. Probably was, because well, this is 56, 53? 59. Um, cool. anyway, I was on the right track. Oh, 50s, yeah, but thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Close enough. Um, I really like it. I really like that he's taking the time to sort of envisage he's realised both at the same time that he wants to talk of his military ideas, but at the same time it's like, oh fuck, I've got to write science fiction. What what would make the military better? Um, and his argument was big fucking suits, which is great. <laughs> yeah, Massive fucking aliens suits that Ripley's going to use. Um, <laughs> I think it's really good. It's like, I, I know you briefly mentioned the um, the, the sort of gender dynamics of, of Starship Troopers, and there's an article, well, it's, sorry, an essay, sorry, um, from Linny Hansen from 2001, who I, th- I think th- the issue with it was that she compares Highland's ideas to fascism when it's more militarism, but the core point of it's pretty good is that he is surprisingly breaking away from the sort of age-old reference of women being housewives and men being warriors, essentially, which is surprising given his relatively conservative views. I'm not saying that's a conservative view to hold, but it just seems to align. Um, especially in the film, it just seems that men and women are very equal in the sense of they're cannon fodder. They can be ripped apart by bugs and sort of exploited for their values as people that can hold and shoot weapons, uh, rather than something that is forward pushing. And I think that's that's quite quite the commentary to make for Heinlein there, is that he's really honing in on the fact that these people are, at the same time as being depthful, they are expendable. And there's an interesting wrinkle to this because when you think about oh, well, if if you read it through the right optics, and by right I mean just not not correct, but you know, appropriate optics for what for what your own agenda is, 
that you could say, of course he's objectifying women. Look at him, right? <laughs> you know, because because then you know because they'll talk about just oh we are stand to attention at the sanctuary and there will be women and just they just look at them because they don't they're not used to looking at women because they all have all men in the regiment like it's just all guys. Yeah, in the, this the, is lacking the, homoeroticism. Uh, no, yeah, but but then there's this there's this sort of concept in there that when you think about in the very beginning, mobile int- infantry is not is not an elite unit that people want to sign up to. This is not like, I want to go and f-, you know like mobile in- infantry and whatever and like and like the guy without legs. Like, mobile infantry is what made me the man I am today, and just <laughs> um, which is satirical, whatever. But um, but he but they filter people out, and then what's left is just like oh you well. If you don't have special skills, we'll just put you in either mobile infantry or just be a test subject for medical reasons or something like this, right? But because the assumption is if you don't have skills, either you're smart enough that we'll give you skills. We'll we'll figure out what what you're good for, right? But the in, implied assumption is that and since there are only men in there, that means women get filtered out ahead of them. So he's I think Heinlein actually has a very high view of women as people who are smart. People who know, like they have, they have skills that that are sort of highly appreciated. Like they're so. He says, "Well, only women can can pilot these things, or they only women can do this, that, or only only women can can just do certain things at once because they have this. Sort of, they're wired in such a way that we, as guys, we have no idea how they do this, right? So mm-hmm. I think he has this sort of um, this viewpoint that that almost you'd have to actually like look away from certain pages to actually still think that he's a misogynist right yeah but he's old-fashioned so that's just like you still have to kind of see this that he's he's a um he's a product of his time he's a product of his time and you kind of have to kind of have to understand this about him that he's not going to be like progressive the way like third wave feminists would want him to be (laughs) Uh, are we canceling robert heinlein here no, <laughs> this is what's happening. <laughs> it's just yeah, but then like with with the sort of suits as well. I think he's for, to me again like the science fiction kind of comes comes last. As in like it's almost like a byproduct that the science fiction comes in that these the sort of aspects because because I think for him it's more of, I think the term is wish fulfillment fantasy. Like this is the stuff that I would like to give our U.S. Marines so that they wouldn't die in their thousands in the Marshall Islands. <laughs> Like this is if the only sort of, they had them. If only they had them, things would have been much better, right? And but because he still leaves the same sort of structure of how these they go about just doing their missions, it's essentially just about these little teams just clearing out jungles and clearing out foxholes, right? So, but 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 he gives them tools that he thinks oh this would save people's lives much better than what we had to do because th- these campaigns were as in like infuriously bloody this was ridiculous if you th- if you think about like the sizes of the battlefields like it's just a, you know a rock hang- sticking out of of the ocean with like a thousand people on it and then another thousand people just trying to take it this is ridiculous mm. stalingrad was was less bloody in like per surface area than this <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think, it's, yeah. It's, sorry, I didn't mean to cut No, off, go for it, go for it. Uh, I was just going to add on, it's like, I think it's just leading on to the Verhoeven thing, but I, I, it's rather telling that not the lead character, but the smartest characters, arguably, in the adaptation of Carmen and Dizzy, who are essentially the two lead female characters. Speaking of... There we go. <laughs> we, we've done it twice this episode. Backdoor test, would she? <laughs> Speaking of the Backdoor test, let's talk about... Starship Troopers is the movie released in 1997, aka when I was born. Yay! You old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that as if I was born two years later. Here I am, I wasn't allowed in the cinema to watch it. <laughs> I, I could watch it. You know, we babies I... can enter. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, so, I was like, your mom is just like, too broad the newborn. <laughs> so, me and Nick are 90s kids because I was 99, so. Heck yeah. You have to yeah, have yeah. your childhood in the 90s to be a I 90s did. I did. Uh, like, I did. Eight, the people yeah. born in the 80s are 90s kids. No, no they're no, 80s no, kids. I'm, they're they're I'm, boomers or something. My sister is from 91, <laughs> and we I experienced a lot of, of things from the 90s through her, so I am yeah. like a 90s yeah, kid. I, 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 I use proxy. floppy disks. I, I used have to play games on floppy disks and all that good stuff. I remember yeah. Recess. And regrets. So VHS tapes. So you're, yeah. yeah. So like you and the naughty's kid. Come on. Oh no no no. Twenty fifth of December ninety nine. You're naughty. You're naughty you're kid. Not. <laughs> anyway, speaking of naughties, Paul Verhoeven. We talked about at length 
about the book, Robert Heinlein, fascism, possibilities of ways to look at the novel. Did we? Well, Paul Verhoeven, well, I don't know, well, Paul Verhoeven looks at the book, read a few chapters and said, this is fascist propaganda, I hate it. Yes, I will. I would love to make a, an adaptation of this film. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, coming hot off the massive bomb that was Showgirls, which we talked at length a few months ago on the Uncut Gems podcast. So definitely go check that out if you haven't already. Um, great movie. And he ended up making Starship Troopers kind of to, you know, uh, get back on track making movies that people want to see. Oh, boy, so, did he. Oh, boy, <laughs> did he. The film came out. It was a... It started off strongly in terms of commercial success, but it was destroyed, annihilated, blown to smithereens by the critics who saw this as the satire that it was meant to be. They saw this as militaristic, propagandistic, patriotic, to an excessive level, racist, uh, jingoistic, and just basically all the comments that were thrown at Heinlein, they were just heightened and even more excessive in the late 90s against this film. It was successful in Europe because Europe understands satire compared to the, to the US. And ultimately, this ended up being a cult classic of sorts. So, Yuan, what's your experience with Starship Troopers, the films, and what are your thoughts on it? Um... Yeah, like every Paul Verhoeven film, became a cult classic. Um, Pretty much, I remember yeah. we spoke of Hollow Man a while ago, which is another True great that. one. Um, oh, man. As far as Starship Troopers goes, I've watched it a couple times. Um, the 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 first time I remember it specifically was a double bill of Starship Troopers and Pretty Woman with my uni flatmates. Um, Based on? What a pairing. Just, <laughs> they were just available. <laughs> <laughs> just... Just the DVDs we had at the time. Oh, man. Um, I love and it. I remember really enjoying it. Um, like, a lot of fun. Like, you could tell Behoven's really going for the jugular with the whole satire thing. But I'm European, so I got it. I'm not American. Not not silly in the brain. Um, Are you saying you're I, not I, Roger Ebert? I was just about to mention <laughs> Roger Ebert, two-star Our boy. Reviewers. Our man. Um, oh, no. <laughs> You know me, Nick. We spoke about Roger Ebert at length. Um, Boy, did we. But you didn't it's... talk about his anti-conservative and anti-gun agenda, did you? <laughs> no, we did not speak of Roger Ebert not understanding what satire is. That, um, that, that, I, neither this. <laughs> yeah. I listened to this episode like twice now. <laughs> I feel as though it's, it's a very American thing to not get Starship Troopers, but then when I think of America, one of the leading thoughts is their military is quite a big one. And, and also, their schooling are... system is fucking sucks. Yeah, well, that as well. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I, I don't remember a day at school where I had to pledge allegiance to a flag. But <laughs> no, it's wait, very it's ingrained. Flag. Jesus, get over it. Let's <laughs> burn it to the ground. <laughs> you can't burn a flag. You have to just you have to disintegrate it somehow. Yeah, you got to put it on a barbecue. <laughs> no, you actually, you, yeah, no, you do it. burn it, I think. you got to bless it first or something, haven't you? you got to like fold it properly and give it a military send-off. Um I could have just made all that up. I have no idea. I'm basing that on an episode of King of the Hill I watched recently. <laughs> um, but to get back on track, the, the Hormans' take on Starship Troopers is what I believed Starship Troopers was to begin with. And now, having had this conversation for the last hour, I've understood that me and Verhoeven were on very different pages to what Heinlein was. And I think that's for the best, because it gives me two different bits of media. The one where I can either pick it apart and use my brain, or the one where I can watch Neil Patrick Harris run around and kill bugs. So... In a Gestapo uniform, essentially. In a Gestapo uniform, with the voice of Mr. Krabs not far behind him. you got to love Clancy Brown. <laughs> that was the end of my point there, sorry. Classic. I should have mentioned that. Clancy yeah, I didn't Brown's mention the cast of this sentences. film, which is stacked for the time. You have Casper Van Dien as Rico. You have Denise Richards as Carmen. You have also Dina Meyer as a new character. You have Neil Patrick Harris, Clancy Brown, Jake Busey, and of course, Michael Ironside. Beautiful, beautiful Michael Ironside. Jakub, your thoughts? I mean, I have to say this. When I was watching, I mean, I've seen this film a number of times. And I've, I mean, I want to say, like, when I watched it in the 90s, I, I watched it on video because I wasn't allowed in the cinema because that was hard <laughs> 18 and where I, where I, I lived. I can't imagine, yeah. Um, so they said, no, nope, you're not allowed in. And I was watching. Did you 13. try? I was 13. So they said, no, nope, they were carding people on, on, the, on the way. Oh, man. 
Uh, <clears throat> so I wasn't allowed in. So I watched it on the video because I can, <laughs> no one carded me in my video rentals. It's, it's a shop. Anyway, um, and then I remember not liking this when I was young, specifically because I didn't get the soap opera appeal. Mm. Like I found that the acting was shit. And that was, you know, like, I was like hot off the heels of just, you know, like I, I was getting into like the Godfather. I, I saw heat in cinemas. I was big oh, into man. like big, big classy acting, you know, as a 13 year old boy, I was getting my, my chevrons, so to speak, just watching. Like you see cinema. Casper Van Diem and say, this is not De Niro. No, this but, but it, actually, it did Diesel. stick out. It really did stick out. Like these people, like I'm just like, these people cannot act for shit. Like, I don't get it. And then over time, I understood, I think that this is maybe this may be on purpose or it may be just a happy accident because he hired a bunch of nobodies because the point was yeah. that you weren't supposed to have like oh this is tom cruise right <laughs> or they couldn't afford one and or you know like i think this was the point they are retroactively famous yeah but i i watched this now having read the book i watched this I'm a, and and my immediate thought was whoever wrote the script either didn't read the book or didn't care. had someone re- read the book for them and then just give them like seven bullet points on what the book's about and then just hold your horses this is me on wikipedia page now development and writing in for the film script writer ed newmeyer had been a fan of the novel since his childhood paul verhoven on the other hand had never read the book <laughs> and attempted to read it for the film but it made him bored and depressed so he read only a few chapters and I quote, I stopped after two chapters because it was so boring. It is really quite a bad book. I asked Ed Newmeyer to tell me the story because I just couldn't read the thing. It, it's a very right wing book. And it's exactly how I felt this was written. I love it. I love it so much. Paul Holman's crying at his desk, just massaging his head. Like, I can't, I can't, can't give do me this. Make this. shit up for me. Like, let's make this up. I mean, and then they just turn this into what they wanted. Like, they turned this essentially into like a Robocop level of satire of mm. sort of right wing politics that this, or, or the conservative politics, because I don't like to use the term right wing for this because it evokes different connotations and shouldn't. Uh, <clears throat> and they turned this into satire, which is weirdly enough stands on its own like it's almost like you forget that the book exists now this is its own thing like it's just separate separated itself from from the book and it's just okay you kind of have to see this as this is an anti-war film and this is again like when you see people like roger ebert or critics of the time saying this is militaristic jingoistic nazi propaganda it's like well i wonder what you would think what you'd think of the book then (laughs) but then it clearly tells me if someone like there's, I don't want to be mean to people who call themselves film critics, but I think that there's the Venn <laughs> overlap between film critics and uneducated morons is quite large. Like, holy shit, how little do you have to know about anything to watch this and see and and, and not see this as a, a as a tongue in cheek satire? Like, how? Yeah. <laughs> is... uh, you have to be like driven by your own political convictions and not be able to. Okay, I need to set my my own shit aside and examine this for what it is. Or, and which I think Roger Ebert did, did because he was famously against like all sorts of violence on screen. Like he was just he could not get this, he could not get past this kind of shit. And I feel like when people go and say things like this, or they will read the book and say like this is fascist. Like again, no understanding of history, no understand of uh, understanding of literature or philosophy. It's just like no, like I saw a word and I connected it to a word that I already know morons all of them sorry by the I way the if you like, are if yeah. you are a critic and or american and you're still listening we love you thank you so much <laughs> continue we, you there's no we about this go to school you. it's the royal we it's the royal we <laughs> the royal we um a royal we is what the what the queen does okay <laughs> on the toilet <laughs> fantastic um yeah, if you watch Starship Troopers and you make it past the first five minutes where you see a child in full military uniform waving and going, I'm doing my part, and you think that's genuine thought of the Hoven. <laughs> like you you're on your own, be... that's like... You, you've got, like, it's very It's you, not the film, it's you, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, even if that's not, like, obvious enough, the, the bit where they're in the classroom, like, just little bits and pieces where it's How like, is drawing... It not obvious? Like, it's... <laughs> it's so <Right> clear... <laughs> It's so it's, like, it almost hurts. It, I, I could actually maybe I would maybe see critics going like you know it's too on the nose. I, I, like it makes Adam McKay look subtle. 
<laughs> well, yeah. Oh. You leave that man alone. Wow. <laughs> and I like him. But but Jesus, like it makes like what what's the new film that he did about the comet? Don't look up. Don't look, Don't look up. up. It but makes it look sure. like it makes it look like Buñuel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like in terms of on the noseness. <laughs> I mean, it's like a, uh... the only film I can think that subverts satire to this extent is <laughs> you're not gonna like me for saying this, Jakob. No, go no. Big Balls Postal. <laughs> I knew <laughs> honestly, it. I, I knew this was gonna happen. I knew where this was going. It's gotta be said because well, I mean, I can see the satire in Postal is just for me. The satire in Postal is kind of undermined by the fact that Uwe Ball is just directing with one hand on his dick and the other and the other fist in his asshole. It's just Look, very the greatest <laughs> films were made like that. Largent was made like that by what's his face, the French fella. Um, Which film? Sorry, Godard. Largent. I'm spell. I'm talking it wrong because I'm from the northeast. Largent. The, the Bresson film. Largent. Largent. Ah, El Argent. El Argent. The eighties one. El. I should have picked something that was a bit easier to pronounce, like um. Mouchette. Name a French film challenge. Pique uh, Amelie's or whatever. Yeah, that's the one. Like, come on, like in certain in certain circles, the word Titan was was a controversy. Hey, that's a really good film though. So still haven't seen it. Brilliant. Brilliant. So it's no, it's a matter of it's the I mean, Starship it's Troopers in 2021. Like, like, oh, I should, I, I need to, I need to watch like three creature features, and it's just okay. I need to watch three creature, or maybe I'll watch Titan on the weekend. Now I end up watching God knows, God knows what for another show. It's just like it's, it's all homework for me. <laughs> Less Jim, more Titan. Jim eats in, into my into my movie watching because nowadays it's like nine hours a week of just lifting time. Jesus, oh man. Anyway. <laughs> What a film. What a film. This was my second time watching it. Um, we all love Paul Verhoeven. We've praised him so many times on, on this oh, podcast. Boy. Many, many times. And I will say Starship Troopers is, is one of my favorites on rewatch. Uh, it was beforehand, but now I, I definitely do prefer others compared to this. But man, oh man, is this fun? Is this exciting? And is this just plain funny? This, like, with we talked about it like it's so like how do you not get that this is meant to be fun how, how i hate people that kind of laugh at something like this and not with it they try to be superior to the movie it's like i can see you not liking other things about starship troopers but come on it's not meant to be serious there's so many things to like here um i think just in terms of very like technical things um it's just so well made like it's age beautifully the blend of cgi early cgi and animatronics and practical effects is stunning i am shocked at how many sh- at how many sequences are primarily done on look on a studio with like special effects just put into this is this gave me in certain sequences watching it this gave me lord of the rings vibes you know i thought you thought you were gonna say this gave me a boner this well <laughs> oh well which? Maybe. We'll talk about that, maybe. Which would be fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. There are some some parts in here, but you know, it is a very it is a very exciting film, and it is more action packed than the novel, definitely. Um, a point of controversy for some people. I don't know why they hated. So, hardcore fans of the novel hate that Verhoeven didn't put the power armors in. Like, I think it's a budgetary like, constraint as it well. It was, yeah. Which, which is like, fair enough. Like, who cares, honestly? We don't want to see them in power arms. But apparently, fans did want to see the power arms. The only reason why they sh- were going to make a movie was this, and they didn't do it. Ah, screw you. Bizarre. But thanks but, to that, thanks to that, the uh, space marines in StarCraft are based on the marines in, um, in the film, whereas Marauders in StarCraft are based on what I think Highland envi- envisioned for the Marines hey, in Mobile Infantry, go. because they're so... F- and the com- commanders are the Reapers, because they can jump faster. So it's, you know, it's all good. So guys in Blizzard, massive fans of both film and the book, I think. True sci-fi fans. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of just plain differences, the only major difference between novel and film is the tone, is the, is the goal. Like you mentioned, like this is an anti-war no- film. It's showing you how atrocious and horrible it is for these soldiers. I f- like Paul Verhoeven loves his quibs, loves his gore, loves his guts, and man, every death in here is 
just horrifying, just utterly painful. There's no glorious moment of like a poetic death. I'm going to say the final words in a glorious manner. It's like, no, no, no. Like if a bug That's catches you, you it's just, just war for you. Like you're just torn to pieces. You're just you're unable to breathe, unable to speak. Your lungs have been pierced. You've just your like legs have been torn off. Wow. How, how do you guys feel about this anti-war message conveyed through the extreme violence? I suppose it's one way of connecting with an audience, though, isn't it? Where it's if okay, you can't get them to listen to reasoned arguments of mm, maybe war isn't too good. Mm-hmm. Start ripping people apart and go and look what actually happens. Because I suppose a lot of people with I, I don't I don't know sort of, sort of people that not idolize war but uh, appreciate it almost sort of like celebrate the soldiers and the military they don't really see the darker side of it which is actually the, the combat and the the horrific brutality of it um and exposing that in a way that verhoeven does is a, a way of cementing that obviously it's science fiction and obviously there aren't giant bugs about the place um except for australia which is a hellhole um there's there's nowhere that's really got big bugs but it, it it gives you the details of people are losing limbs people are getting torn apart it's very clearly shown straight away with um is it michael ironside um with his lack of arm mm-hmm. and then he just yeah is that colonel and, uh, dubois also didn't have an arm right and he was putting the horror show for the students to dis- discourage them from joining the yes army, yeah which is yeah. exactly the opposite of what the teacher was doing in all quiet on the western front yep yeah yeah, yeah. And it's very, uh, I I really like this. In a way, this is this is like The Shining, you know. You have Shining the book, which is one mm-hmm. thing. You have Shining the film, which is similar but very different at its core. And sure. both can coexist in a wonderful place because I like I like the like, overtly fascist imagery in this to the point that. Like the, the 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 eagle has a, like this is just a German Nazi there's eagle. The Come eagle. On. There's the outfits of the like Karl the, uh, the yeah the SS sort of the SS like yes. coat <laughs> and he has the, the, the hat. And, and all of those parts are like very very funny to me, uh, especially because I mean we're talking about Paul Verhoeven, someone who was born right at the end or when World War Two was still going on. I forgot, but still like in the forties. Is he like 1948? 1938. 1938. Oh, he's an old geezer. He's very old. Jeez. <laughs> um, older than I thought. And yeah, and so he's, he's, he lived through it then. And he's had family members impacted by the war. And so it's, like, it's even commendable what he's trying to do in here to, you know, discourage people, especially with the time that it came out. Because if you're taking... We talked about the original novel coming out at the end of the Korean War when the Vietnam conflict and the entry of the U.S. was just starting. And here we're like right, right next to the beginning of the Iraq War, right after the Gulf War and all of those things, like just a couple years apart. It's creepy. It's eerie. And people didn't get it. And that's a shame. Hmm. That's a shame. You know, I think I honestly believe that the film should not be should be completely disassociated from the book because like different name different characters yeah yeah, yeah. like just because no like, if, if, you, if you're a fan of the book then you're honestly you're going to go and compare and then you're not gonna like the like you're gonna just have an allergic reaction to the film mm-hmm. and if um and yeah so weirdly enough and then if you go and watch the film and then you'll be disappointed with the book because you'll be like or if you watch the film and you like it oh look look at this and then read the book and say, the fuck is this? <laughs> that's so, me but the, it looks like they didn't care either so it's just like if you read the book and then you watch the film and I, like i like the film a lot and then, then you watch it's like oh they take lieutenant, lieutenant rastrak and he's he has he's he's a completely different character in the book mm-hmm. than he is in the film and just, they just smooshed these characters together they give them different sort of things to do. Mm-hmm. They almost—it's almost like, oh, I like the character's name. Let's put him there. I don't care that he does this. Let's put him there. And it's just, you know, oh, we need a woman in here because you know we need to have a love interest. So let's let's have Dizzy Flores in, in here. And I think the Dizzy the love Flores triangle. Is, yeah, let's let's have a, let's let's have a, yeah. So they're just cherry picking uh, material, which could be infuriating for someone who really loves the book, as in like nerd level passionately <laughs> loves the book 
and to to me this is it's not that it's unacceptable but I, f- I feel this is the detriment to 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 the sort of the lasting legacy of the film because the film has its own legacy that should be i think it, it should be respected because it has, has stuff to say even if it's extremely on the nose satirical but it, but it's kind of just that's what it is and then when you think about it people didn't get it at the time 1997 in because oh like they didn't see the connection that this is that this is an anti-war film essentially this is um like this is trying to be like um all quiet on the western front in space only elevated and and then kind of almost kind of written without much research if you know what i mean <laughs> just, that's a, that's a <laughs> i think they because they pick and choose these things oh let's let's have this guy be whipped whatever and then they, in the book i think Heinlein was a I think it was again like old fashioned in this way that he was just like he was a fan of corporal punishment. Like he was just like you have to you beat need the your discipline. Kids. Yeah. You have to beat if you don't beat your kids, then they're gonna go and go go astray because they don't have their own morality. They acquire morality as they go. Like he was like he was outlining this very old fashioned philosophy, <laughs> and then here you just have this guy whipped, and he's just like oh because like, because this it's so easy to do because this is where he connected us. Oh, it's just Nazi Germany. This is what they did. So you know. It's, but overall, like in 1998, like Saving Private Ryan came out and people lost their shit for, and pe- rightly so, for the opening sequence for the landing in, in the Omaha beach, right? Because mm-hmm. it's so lifelike, it's so realistic that people, I, I've, I've heard, I think it was, I can't remember, on some kind of a podcast, someone was mentioning that he took, they took their dad or fa- or grandfather to see this and he yeah. couldn't see, couldn't stand it because he was just like, I smelled diesel when I watched this. Like it was just it was bringing up these sort of memories of holy shit! Like I've, I've survived this this hell horror, right? Proper PTSD, yeah. But yeah. in here you have the sort of science fiction equivalent of the Somaha Beach, which is sort of like, well, we're just these these people being sent to die in a meat grinder, sort of essentially, uh, w- without any preparation, and then with this sort of horde of 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 enemies that you can't possibly defeat they have, they have to like unload 150 rounds each to, to kind of take one of these things on and by the way the bug the, the bug design i think this is this is what the roaches in starcraft were based on <laughs> just saying <laughs> so i don't know to me to me to, to me this has like the violence uh like i don't i don't see how people don't get it that's <laughs> this is again this is this is all quiet on the western front but it's in space anyway over <laughs> Yeah, I, I think what I find especially disturbing in here is that, like, you take the ending of the novel, which is very heroic, which is all about the, you know, he's leading his own command, and his, the father is there as well, and everything's great, and they keep on fighting the bugs, and blah, blah, blah. And in here, it's very similar. There's this massive battle on the planet of the bugs, which is a fun name. I forgot the name. Uh, Glendatu. Klendatu, Klendatu. It's also um, in the book. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And they have this, 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 like, oh, oh, like oh, the entire conflict ends very well, but there's no real sense of joy, of satisfaction at the end. It's, it's terrifying to see these soldiers that's completely dehumanized and just hungry with blood and with lust for violence and revenge. Mm hmm. And the way they're torturing, like they capture the, the the big queen, the queen, the, the brain bug, the brain bug. It's a hive mind. It's all connected. And <laughs> well, in the book, they have a brain bug. It's just it's very small because one soldier can carry it. Yeah, it's not it's not this massive gigantic creature. And it doesn't have a big gaping vagina. You gotta make it a bit <laughs> Hollywood. Yeah, which is Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> so so much Paul Verhoeven in this. Like, look at him. Like, and they just just penetrated with this sort of thing and just censored all across the thing. <laughs> symbolism, ladies and gentlemen. This is full I mean, for Paul speaking Roman. of symbolism, I think it's it's not just the, the criticism of fascism and militarization, but I think it's it, Starship Troopers does to me feel like a bit of a criticism of where the action genre was at at the time. Um, especially when you look at the, you know, the, the, the lead characters. I mean, if you think about what came out action-wise that year, it's like Men in Black, uh, mm-hmm. Alien Resurrection, Con Air, Face Off, Mission Violent Impossible. Films. Was that the Mission 96. Impossible? Ninety six. Ninety six. Yeah, but stuff that's you know it's pretty violent, but it's not as graphic or gory as Starship Troopers was, and it obviously has the crutch of well, it's science fiction. Nobody could see that. I've just an air quotes. I've just realised that now, um, <laughs> because we're not a visual medium. 
However, uh, my point would be to that as well as though is that not just the action feels a bit more graphic and violent and really quite brutal, but the the implementation of female characters, which at the time, if you especially you know Tomorrow Never Dies came out the same year, where it's you know women used as essentially romantic objects of interest, like they were in Face Off, like they were in you know Batman and Robin, I suppose as well, which came out the same year. What what a year ninety seven was, man. But my point is is that Dina Mayer and Denise Richards, who play um D- Dizzy and Carmen, they feel like fleshed out characters in a, in a period that didn't really have. Or oh, in a soap opera. Yeah, in a soap opera aesthetic, yes, but at the same time, feel like valuable cast members, especially considering the the, the obsoleteness of them in the Bond films or some such other. You know, it, it feels very different. Um, even if it is a soap opera, but to be fair, of course it's a soap opera. There's a fucking Busey in this film. It's not Gary, but it's Jake, and that's just as bad. His little son. And yeah, the way he plays the violin is very disturbing to me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and speaking of the cast, I think... W- like, I don't want to talk about the whitewashing. I don't care. Because, I mean, it was called Johnny Rico, and it was meant to be Filipino, so I don't know. Wasn't I don't he, know was he thing. supposed to be Filipino? Yeah, there's a moment where they say it near the end. Hmm. Where he's like talking with another soldier or something. Oh, he's right, like, right. yeah, I come from the Philippines. I was like, you, Juan Rico is Filipino? Okay. I mean, he's I mean, living in they, Buenos they Aires. They do have Spanish okay. names, don't they? Yeah. It was just Because it was, it was for a long time a Spanish colony, right? Yeah. It was, it was just fascinating, you know, the connection to Buenos Aires. But I can overlook that. It's just I don't care. People, yeah. Apparently, I was reading up some reviews. Mm-hmm. <laughs> people hate the whitewashing, apparently. Because oh, of God, again. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to focus on that. We're not going to focus on that. It's not exactly Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's levels. No. Terrible. The, oh. Well, it's not even trying to be. That's the funny thing. It's not even trying to be racially coded in any way, which is fun. I, I, I think part of it maybe because Verhoeven probably hasn't actually read Starship Troopers and didn't get that far into the book and never I mean, thought. They, they do have a token black character, which, which is fair enough for the mid nineties, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of expected. It's the mid nineties. Yeah, Almost, I would even say like if they thing. did complete a complete whitewash, it actually would would kind of play into the satire a bit better because it would be a racially homogenous uh, fascist state. Hey, right. Go. Well, it's got um, this. this Jeff, they're Jeff all like Williams super it, pretty and super blonde. They're all, and like, they're all, they also be, should be like these sort of the Aryan blondes, like <laughs> the yep, yep. <laughs> perfect specimen. <laughs> so, Sorry, you one. That's all right. Recast Casper Van Dien as. Gary Busey, and I think we're under a winner. It's like under siege, but not just recast Casper Van Dien. Just give it to anyone. Just John recast Cusack. Everyone. I don't know someone. Just not John him. Cusack would be quite good actually. <laughs> John John Cusack went on to make shit. So honestly, he might need to, break. to me, Casper Van Dien in this movie is like hey, Elizabeth Berkeley. Wait, what's her name? No. Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth uh, Berkeley. Liz- yes. Elizabeth Berkeley. Yes. From in Showgirls. Showgirls. Because it's it's not something you would say it's a conventionally good performance, but it's Is great it? for the film that it's in yeah, it and for the, the character. Aesthetic. It fits the aesthetic. It fits the character on the page. Um, yeah. Because he's this clueless little little supposedly teenager. Nine oh two one old teenagers. Come on, they're all twenty seven. Yeah, it's like yeah, like borderline first. Um, <laughs> I can I can roll with that, but honestly. I don't know how you guys feel about her, but Dina Meyer in this movie, she steals it. She runs away with it. She does like 20 laps and she's not tired. She keeps on like pumping. Like, man, she is fantastic in this film. I thought she was great in the first time around, but just in this rewatch, she's great. And I love how different and genuine she is compared to like um, Casper Van Dien and Reese Richards. And I think it's entirely on purpose, right? Like she's the lot. She's the. She's strong. She's doing better things than the men are. She's confident. She's bold. She gets what she wants, and she dies. And we've heard that it's kind of the loss of everything that was kind of good, like the last remnant of humanity for Johnny. You could even say Johnny was a complete asshole who mistreats her completely. Was just enamored with. Denise Richards is this super pretty blonde that's just playing around with him, and she tells him like, "I, I really love you." Until, <laughs> like, until Rastra gives him advice, don't pass up on a good thing. Well, I mean, if Dina Meyer is dancing in front of you, don't pass up on a good and thing. It's man. Like someone has to say to him like, "She is thirsty for you, 
for God's sake, if you don't go and bang her, I will. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So, we, we are glossing over a little bit the best cast member, um, Dean Norris, who's the commanding officer for some reason. Oh, uh, Hank from Breaking Bad. Hank from Breaking Bad. Or for those of my age, um, what you call him? He was, uh, was, it, was Officer, he uh, Officer Collins in Heaven Almighty. All oh, right, I thought we were going to go back to my <laughs> the classic. Some would say, "Hey, that's one of the <laughs> seven films I've seen him in." <laughs> no, I don't like. I, I think the film is weird. I don't know. I, cast is kind of helps me, uh, like this because there there's no. Tom Cruise, there's no Melanie Griffith in here. There's no no, no yeah. one kind of who, who in the 1990s you'd kind of recognize us. Oh, look at them. They're probably the hero because they probably paid them the most, right? Um, <laughs> so it kind of helps you, I think, to kind of just get invested in a group as a as an ensemble, I think. Although they have yeah. those sort of moments yeah, yeah. where it's just, it's a bit ridiculous. <laughs> and then, you know, you also have the sort of the staple old um, sort of Paul Verhoeven's uh, um, you know the the sort of the gender neutral uh, showering, which which makes That's an a appearance, classic scene. which makes an appearance in RoboCop first. I think they they have a gender neutral locker room. Um, yeah, it's not sexualized in any way. It's very very progressive. Although uh, the story goes in there that apparently uh, he Verhoeven said, "Okay, I want you to uh, film this massive shower scene together, and this has to be and complete. It's completely non sexually charged, by the way. Like it's, you you watch this, there's just a bunch of naked people. Um, so it's not like." Uh, like the opening of Carrie yeah. that's kind of just like a little bit lurid <laughs> it's probably Verhoeven's least sexy movie uh, like out but, of all of them but the story goes that the actors agreed to do this if Verhoeven would be naked as well bless him <laughs> and he was <laughs> so stood behind like, the camera he stripped down the entire crew was naked and so everyone was naked in the rooms and, and they filmed in, with, with everyone with their ding dongs out. So, you know. he, he pulled a Lars von Trier. So, you know, <laughs> respect. So, you know, and I know that it's like, oh, whitewashing here and there. But it, it, we, we see there's there are certain ele- elements of like this sort of. Pro- I mean, I know Dizzy kind of just follows Rico to, to the military almost and just also to her own grave, right? Because he's like, well, oh, she you're was already- a boy. Wasn't she already trying to like? She already wanted to enlist herself, I think. Right? I think. I think. I, we, I we think you said that like that, but I think I don't know. She gets accused, I think, of following a man to 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 the to the army, right? Um, but yeah, so I think it's interestingly in places it's weirdly progressive for its time, as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, and, uh, and one one thing I wanted to mention because like when Ewan was was talking about like oh, other things that this film is satirizing, we haven't really touched on this. The media. Yeah. This like, is like would a you like to know more? 2.0. Oh, like the is, and uh, so, intermissions. Yes, yeah, and it, but it's so on the nose. Like it, it makes again, like it makes Robocop look like Buñuel, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but um, because they have these sort of like, well, they will show these disemboweled bodies everywhere, and it's all fine. Like it's all great. Like or they will show his and or oh, a Buenos Aires attack, and there's these like dead babies, and they focus in on a dog. Just to like, because dogs get people's get people's emotions up, or they will show like, oh, you censor it when the bug eats a cow, because that's something you can't show on the TV, but you can show you can show like disemboweled sort of like what what is this like the settlers on Clendatu, which also by the way, this is on on this watch, I, this was my thought. I, I was thinking because you know like you could, whereas the while the book I could see as a as a veiled allegory for the Pacific War. This has more to do with like the American conquest of the Wild West. It does look like this, yeah, the setting with the you have the, the sort of the outposts, the settlers, the and tents, then, basically the tents, and then and and the, and the bugs are like a stand-in for the natives who just come out of like the Comanches. They come out of nowhere. They will just overwhelm them and fuck off, and then just and it feels like they're just like these sort of. The American cavalry, they're just um, walking these sort of canyons. It feels like it's an anti-Western, like, that, that mm-hmm. way. It's very, it's, it's I, 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 the iconography in this and the visuals in general just striking. Um, some would say iconic. I would not, honestly, but it is very memorable. Um, and it kind of shaped uh, the look of, uh, well, I don't want to say it's shaped the look of other sci-fi movies, but, you know. Starcraft again, the big bugs that shoot things, that's investors. Or even like the Halo series, 
yep. definitely took some some pointers. Helmets, helmets alone. Come on. <laughs> helmets, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and even then, there's bugs, bug-like creatures. But yeah, it's I honestly, it warms my heart that we live in a time where Paul Verhoeven movies are being revalued, rediscovered for what they really are. Maybe we're just seeing in it, into it. I don't know, but. I, like, I really like the guy. There's not a single movie of his that I don't like. And Starship Troopers is definitely a really darn good one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I can't disagree it, with that. Yeah. It, is, it is weird <laughs> that it, it takes time for, for his films to kind of be either understood or appreciated. It's going, because I feel he, nev- he never strays away from like pushing buttons. So it's like yeah. people kind of have these knee-jerk reactions of like, this is shit. Look at this, and it, it's just—it's annoying because it doesn't align with my poli- politics, and it's definitely <laughs> right wing go away. Or like, they will just look at showgirls and say, "This is objectification of women." It's a satire of this object. <laughs> I feel like even even Hollow Man had its issues with that oh, as yeah, well. Yeah. I feel like he's so consistently, and I don't know how he does it, where he takes on very broad and different topics each time, but the exact same point every time he's releasing something. You've got to wait for the ground to settle. Before you can actually think, oh yeah, that's that's actually a very good point he's made there, and it's years in the future. It probably is like, you know, that's probably not helpful for the trajectory of his career, but it is helpful for people well. that really like his movies. To be fair, there's definitely a double standard here that needs to be addressed. That you can make something like Showgirls, which is considered like the worst movie of the century, and two years later he made a multi-million sci-fi movie. Or yeah, was it 20th century? No, Touchstone. So, like, you know, it's... And meanwhile, like, Elizabeth Berkeley was thrown under the bus and didn't recover ever. Yeah. Do you so, you know, there's definitely that. Might have been, oh, uh, well, he did Basic Instinct Total Recall. Maybe it was just a, a wobble. Let's give him another shot. And then he blew a budget of considerable, considerable uh, weight. I mean, the, so the double standard would be something that we talked about on the Deep Impact episode. If he was a woman, mm. then uh, if, he, uh, if he had... Uh, a oh, showgirls yes, yes, level, yes. a showgirls level of fuck up, then it will be like that's it for you here, like you're done, right? But yeah, but because he's a guy, or parents, oh, you know, he earned us money before. Let's give him another show. And it's a, it's a pattern, right? It's a very sad pattern. But at the end of the day, like for what happened in history, we can only like we cannot like critique history, of course, but we shouldn't dwell on it too much. Improve for the future. Uh, but as it stands, like I, I like. Verhoeven's career ultimately I don't even see him as being prescient per se but he's just taking you know hot button issues for the time and just commenting on them every time and at the time of release they're hated like you said Yaku but then they're revalued like he did that I I think the only one that didn't really work in that sense was Benedetta because Benedetta was like no 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 no, 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 I, I mean like I don't know We'll see. We'll see. I, I mean, I'm honestly, it's the together with L, like L and Benedetta are the only ones that I watched, being aware of Verhoeven and liking his other movies. So I'm interested to see how they change over time. So and they like both really much. But what's the uh, consensus about L and Benedetta these days? By the way, like because uh, I, I, I'm of, of, of the Twitter like sphere. It. Yes, of the Twitter sphere. Uh, I th- I think L Twitter doesn't like it because it's glorifying rape. And Benedetta, uh, I don't know. I think it's Benedetta, like people art. lost, people <laughs> lost their mind on Benedetta because it's, uh, I don't know, like they just want they are horny, people are horny, horn dogs, and they wanted a hot lesbian sex, and they yeah, got it in Benedetta. Jerk reactions, it's knee jerk criticism. Like if if Paul Verhoeven had to start start his career from scratch, or like he, if he didn't exist in the like eighties and nineties, and he's had to start now people wouldn't get it like at all. He would be canceled immediately because like, it seems like people have this sort of knee-jerk reaction that he actually preys upon. He wants you to have this knee-jerk reaction and go like, oh, hold on a second. He's <laughs> making fun of this. <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> I get it now. But you're supposed to have this. And nowadays we live in this sort of like age of outrage where it's just like, no, I'm now I'm angry. I'm going to remain angry. And that's it. And my and my mind's made up, and it's settled. This is horseshit. And I'm going to go on Twitter. And I'm going to make sure that this guy's children are going to be harassed in school. Okay. Yeah. Heck yeah. Ah, and on that beautiful note, <laughs> it's time for the last question. Ewan. Hello. At the end of the day, which do you think is best? Which do you prefer, mm. the book mm. or the movie? 
Starship Troopers. I came into this thinking the book was better than the film. Mm. I am leaving this thinking that the film is better than the book. Mm, okay. Um, what made you change your mind? I think it's a lot of what Jakob said about the book and then learning a bit more about Heinlein because as as ever I've made no notes. Um, but learning about you know the fact Oh he means he was, it. Oh Jesus sincere, <laughs> like genuinely Damn like, it, Jakob. <laughs> No, that's, I, my, that's I think... my superpower. Just making sure that people don't like what I what I talk about. <laughs> <laughs> that's not to say the book's bad. I just think the film lines up with what I thought Heinlein was getting at in a way that it's not more digestible, not not better to watch, but more in the sense of yeah, that's that's where I thought Heinlein was going. I could still read Heinlein's book and see that, but knowing that. It's more of a light criticism than a full blown satire. I don't think it changes the quality of the book because the story and the actual dedication of science fiction is very strong. Um, I don't really think it changed my viewpoint of the book. I still think it's a very great book. I just think now that the Hovens rattled it, nailed it down, being like, this is what it means, and everybody essentially leveled him with the criticism they should have had for Heinlein, I just think that's quite, quite a beautiful turn. He didn't turnaround. read it as well. Yeah, he didn't even read it. He just knew. He just knew. A man from the 50s writing about war, I wonder what he could mean. Easy. I mean, let's just unpack this just for a second, just briefly. Because you were saying, oh, like, no. oh, I, I came in here liking the book because yeah. of what you thought the book was about. And then you, you, you come across me and, and, and I think what I think, and, and I say what I think the book is about. And you think, oh, you may be right. This is maybe what this book is about. I don't like it then. Because it, no, like, no, it no, kind of no, sounds no. like in your head was like, it was like, Starship Troopers must be a satire. So I'll like whichever is closer to the satire. So it's not that I don't <laughs> like Starship Troopers. It's just that the, my experiences are now more closely aligned with the film rather than the book. So, but it kind of just I, could, what you said would kind of be. I, I could, you, I could paint it as sort of like, like you have your own sort of convictions, and then you kind of just whichever fits better is, is the one I like. Yes, we've <laughs> got to be contrarian. We've got to sell it somehow. You know, the more people, the better. Which is <laughs> like, you know, no, like these, uh, like, like Roger. Ebert, no, it boils again. down to more than that. It's whichever like, doesn't have the it. violence gets the four stars. <laughs> 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 the Roger Ebert mentality. <laughs> no, I think a, a lot of it comes down to as well, like the visualization of those messages, of those meanings, and of those sort of not caricatures, but the ideas very prevalent in Starship Troopers taking on a new meaning. I always like it when adaptations go not wildly off center, but to the point where they're taking the same ideas and just spinning them in a way that is very different to the book. Mm -hmm. The presentation rather, is everything. Yeah, the presentation for the book and the film is kind of like, you know militaristic very similar it's the way it's described and the way it's looked at and viewed that changes so rapidly mm -hmm. that's more than fair more than fair Jakub I can't pick because I think this, ah. is, an, this is an unfair comparison because like, are you doing, going the shining route with this uh, I, th I think that's the way to go for me because it's they're so far apart and especially that the adaptation is kind of written and directed with the express knowledge that no one ever read this book. <laughs> I mean, Neumeier did and then he clearly was overruled on, on many things because he's like, Paul, we can't do this this way. It's not like in the book. Fuck you. Who's going <laughs> to care? Who's going to care? So, uh, so I feel like I, uh, the proper way for me to express is what I want to express is I like the book for what the book is and I think it's illuminating about certain aspects of our history, and it's illuminating about the author. If you actually, if, if especially if you filter it through, I, I think if you filter it through the through the lens I was reading it through, and then the film is 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 its own thing because it's an overt satire and it succeeds on the, on its own merits. It's almost like it's unrelated to the book because it's it takes its. It, it it puts this story in its in into its own terms and succeeds on its own terms, so it's it's fine. So I like both; they're all great. I would recommend both to not to the same people. I wouldn't recommend <laughs> the film to the fans of the book, and I wouldn't recommend the the, the film to the fan no the the book to the fans of the film. But that's what it is. So I'm gonna leave it at that. A cop out. I'm sorry. No, oh, but I, I like it. I like it. You you gave solid motivations. Uh, my pick is much easier. I'm the same as you, and I, I largely prefer the movie over the book. But as I mentioned earlier, it's primarily a matter of pure enjoyment. I know it's shallow, completely shallow, but 
I definitely took way more out of the film rather than the book, despite really appreciating some elements of the book. And it's definitely thought provoking. And I think that came through very strongly in the conversation that we had as well. It's not an easy read. And it's something that you can analyze in many different ways. I think if you want to see the fascist angle, you can see it. If you want to take it purely as satirical, as you want proved, you can even enjoy it as that. At the end of the day, I do really prefer the film <laughs> over the book. <laughs> it's a shallow, shallow answer, but, you know, it do be like that sometimes. So, this is the end of our conversation on Starship Troopers. Very, very fun. Really enjoyed it. Yakub, where can our listeners find you on social media? Oh, you can find me at Talk About Film on Twitter, Jakub Flash on Letterboxd. You can find my writings on flashonfilm.com and over, or, and occasionally on, on clapperltd.co.uk. And then also listen, listen to uh, the podcast I run together with Nicolo and, and with Randy. Yeah. Uh, Uncut Gems Podcast. Uncut Gem- at Uncut Gems Pod everywhere or Uncut Gems Podcast.com where we talk about films that no one gives a shit about. Yeah, like, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're entering our... the Halloween season. When is when is this coming out? Oh Halloween season, end of September. Oh my goodness. End okay, of so October. Is it, yeah, so well we're we'll gearing up to a Halloween season ourselves then. <laughs> this yeah. Is we... yeah, so go and listen. It's a it, it's a long form conversation about, about people don't give a shit about. So you know if you have about <laughs> three and a half hours of, of, of free time, go and listen. Absolutely. Yuan, where can our listeners find you on social media? On the old social front, um, they can get me on Twitter and Letterboxd at Ewan Cledo, E-W-A-N-G-L-E-A-D-O-W. It's not my fault my name's difficult to type. <laughs> it's not my fault I've got relatives in Scotland. Sorry about that. Um, and you can get my writing on Cult Following, where I'm currently fielding a lot of comments from angry Bob Dylan fans still, naturally. Um, you crave the attention. They admit fucking it. will not leave me alone, but the analytics are delightful. Um, you can get me on... Uh, here, obviously, you can get me a death by adaptation. Um, Clapper, um, Newcastle World, Daily Star, Daily Mirror. All, the, all those wonderful places. Just fucking wipe the rest of them out. <laughs> there's anymore. The more active ones. <laughs> you, the yeah, so yeah, the ones that actually... for the sun, for the uh, pastry oh. write up for the ladies, and they're like, Josie lo- likes <laughs> likes fishing and go, <laughs> going. I write the weather report for the left of those articles. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at NickyGran97. You can go to my Linktree, Linktree forward slash enjoy the movies. Leave links to my YouTube, Vimeo, Clapper articles, uh, portfolio, all the good stuff. Of course, as Jakub mentioned, listen to the Uncut Gems podcast. And you can also follow us, Death by Adaptation, on Twitter and Instagram at Death by Adaptation Pod. So stay tuned, because in two weeks' time, we will be talking about Rum Punch, a.k.a. Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown. So stay tuned for that. We hope to see you soon. We hope you have a fabulous day. And we hope that you enjoyed this conversation. Bye-bye. <laughs>